money I'm aiming to achieve. And it's for all those who just want to get on in life, who just want to do the best by their children and look to the government to give them that little bit of help. And the government I lead is backing you. We're on your side. And I think that we should all worry about the alternative. Uh, because the alternative, as I say, is the possibility of Jeremy Corbyn being Prime Minister, of John McDonnell being in charge of our economic future, of Diane Abbott in charge of our national security, and all the time the strings being pulled by the Liberal Democrats and the Scottish Nationalists. So if you don't want to see Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister, if you don't think he's equipped to negotiate Brexit to protect our economic security and keep our nation secure, then vote for your local Conservative candidate. I think uh, that if he were to be there, we would see chaos and confusion, because what would happen is he'd be sitting around that table 11 days after the election day uh, with the Chancellor Merkel, President Macron, and all the presidents and prime ministers and chancellors of Europe. Um, at the same time, he'd be trying to put a government together here in the UK. Uh, I think we would see chaos, and that would have our consequences for our country. So I'm offering a better future and a different way forward. I want to build this stronger, more prosperous Britain. Yes, it is about ensuring that we get Brexit right and getting the best deal for Brexit, but it is about doing so much more to ensure that we can become that country that is even more prosperous, taking uh, our place in the world and standing tall in the world, offering opportunities to young people here in the UK. That's what my plan for a stronger Britain is about. And what I offer you is the resolute determination to get on with the job, to deliver Brexit and make a success of it. Optimism that we can get a deal that will work for all and confident that I have the vision and the plan and the will to get on with the job and deliver a better Britain for the future. And I believe that can be done because I believe in Britain and I believe in the British people. So I am offering myself as your Prime Minister. I'm asking you to back me, but it's only you, the people, who can give me the mandate. So give me the backing to lead Britain Give me the authority to speak for Britain. Strengthen my hand as I fight for Britain. Give me your backing and I will deliver for Britain. Thank you. Right, does anybody have any, uh, any questions? Yes. There's no doubt in my mind there's no doubt in my mind at all that as Churchill was needed in the time of the Second World War, you are needed at this time to do what is necessary with Europe. But there is one thing that worries me. About, you give me a dilemma, and that is you're set to take away many of the traditional uh, uh, things that we've come accustomed to uh, enjoying in this country in our rights and freedoms of freedom of expression, uh, freedom of, of uh, we're, um, faith and all these other things through your um, policy with regard to British values. Now, we have British values that we've fought for over generations through the war, and they're being turned upside down by the government of the day, bringing out what they think is what they, and what they think is wrong. You're going to bring a sweep a lot of people into the British values problem that weren't there before. They're miles away from terrorism, yet they're going to be involved, perhaps in even being investigated. I don't, that's a problem for me. Well, I hope I've got a mic, it's okay. <laughs> I, I, I hope um, that what I'm going to say to you will reassure you. Because, first of all, we don't want to sweep away the traditions that have underpinned our society for years. Freedom of expression, freedom of faith, these are absolutely crucial to our society and crucial to our democracy. And it is important that we stand up and talk about those and allow people that freedom of expression and freedom of faith. 
what we do need to do, of course, is ensure that those who are trying to divide us as a society, that those who are preaching hate in order to try to divide us, that we do act in relation to those individuals. And yes, one of the things I want to do is to set up a commission to look at countering extremism, because extremism can lead to radicalisation. But this isn't about doing away with uh, the traditional values that have underpinned our society. What I want to do is reinforce those values and ensure that across the whole of the UK, across the whole of Britain, we all recognise the things that unite us and bring us together as one country. And those are our British values. It is about freedom of expression, about freedom of speech, about freedom of faith, our rule, belief in the rule of law and order, our belief in our democracy. These are all other things that actually underpin what being British is about. And where I want to strengthen those, and I want to go out there and lord those and say to everybody, let's get together and say, this is what being British is about. Yes, I think there was one oh, oh, here. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Um, we know um, that Brexit is happening. And I make no apologies. Uh, I'm a firm believer that the UK's success, the United Kingdom's success, is based outside the European Union. And I make no apologies for that. So on that level, um, I'm pleased that you're the Prime Minister and that you're acting on our behalf in that way. However, we also know that this country has an enormous amount of social problems. And social welfare is something that will be with us long after Brexit. And I'm particularly concerned, what will your government do about social welfare? And in, in particular, the rising, the rising tide of homelessness on our streets. Homelessness and food banks. Uh, our local MP, who is standing just behind you, when he was canvassing at the last election, we had some canvasses at the door. And I asked those canvassers, what will you do about homelessness? What will you do about the people that are living on our streets? They didn't give me a satisfactory answer. I'm now looking to you to give me some kind of answer to that question. Yes, well, first of all, can I just comment on, on what you said about Brexit? Because I believe it is absolutely right that we respect the will of the people in the vote that took place last year and that the government gets on and delivers Brexit. But you're right, there are issues for us here at home that we need to be dealing with. And on the one of, of homelessness, um, we announced, I think it was earlier this year, we're putting over a period of years something like five, over £500 million into trying to deal with homelessness. But we, you, you need to deal with it on a number of in a number of different ways. Now, of course, at one end, there's the issue of making sure there are more affordable homes available for people, and we will build more affordable homes. But it's also about trying to prevent people becoming homeless in the first place. And there is a whole variety of reasons which lead to people um, becoming homeless. For some people, there are some issues, for example, about mental health problems. For, you know, there's a variety of things that one could list that can lead to that homelessness. And one of the things we're doing, and again, we put in some more money just at the turn of the year, into working with a number of groups around the country, looking at a number of pilot projects, which are about trying to identify when people might be at risk of homelessness and actually being able to intervene before they get on the streets, before they become homeless. We've also, the particular, uh, one of, another particular concern is rough sleeping. And that's about, and we're looking around the world at some very good practice that takes place elsewhere in the world and saying, will that work here in the UK and how can we adapt that here in the UK? So you're absolutely right to be concerned about homelessness and, uh, and rough sleeping. We're trying to tackle it in a number of different ways, but we have got a number of projects on and we're putting more money in to do it. <coughs> Is there some, anybody else? Uh, anybody from the workforce before the media? Yes. Uh, my local Conservative MP in Chippenham has been very vocal on the subject of fairer funding, for, fairer funding formula for schools. Yet despite that, the, the headmaster of the local school has written to all parents explaining the impact of the cuts as they will be over the next couple of years. Can you reassure assure me as to what you will do over the next five years to maybe reverse uh, or address those funding cuts for state secondary schools? Yes. Yeah, I know Michelle's been vocal on it because she's asked me a couple of questions in Prime Minister's questions uh, about it. What we, first of all, we're going to continue to put record levels of funding into the schools. I think it is right that we have a fairer formula for distributing that school funding because we see at the moment there are some schools in the country that get twice as much funding per pupil as others. So I think we do need to make it a fairer system. We, we published a document with a proposed formula in it. 
we've got consultation on that. We're now having an election. Um, we will look at the right actual formula to use, but what we're committing to is that no school will lose out in cash terms as a result of a new fair funding formula coming in. But we do want to try to get a greater fairness in the distribution of that funding. But no school will lose out in cash terms as a result of introducing a new, a new formula. Yes. Hello. Over a third of our sales are currently with the EU, and we also purchase items and have customer returns, all moving freely. It is likely that whatever deal is negotiated, the costs associated with these movements, as well as our admin costs, will increase. How are the Conservatives going to ensure that companies like Cross are not going to be disadvantaged? Well, the first thing is that when we look at our trading relationship in the future with the European Union, with the remaining European Union, we want to negotiate a comprehensive free trade agreement, and we want as tariff-free and fri uh, as tariff-free trade and frictionless free frictionless borders as possible as part of that agreement. Now, that's about the negotiations that are going to start, as I say, 11 days after the uh, the election day. Um, so that's what we're working for, and if you think about it, we. There's an advantage for us in the UK in that we've already been part of, as you say, as part of the EU, we're trading freely with people at the moment. We're trading on similar standards and regulations. And so I think that that should be easier for us to negotiate a free trade agreement than for countries that come com as completely third parties. Um, it, it, it is, but it's about, it's about the negotiations. On the border, because one of the issues you raised is the admin costs, which of course, um, depending on how you get the arrangement of trade across the border, that may well be where you're thinking that admin costs might come in. We have a very real incentive to making sure that we see that uh, trade across borders being as frictionless as possible, because we want to ensure that we don't see a return to the borders of the past between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So we're looking at a whole variety of solutions that could offer that frictionless border for us in the future. But of course, we then have to sit down with the European Union and negotiate that. And that's why I've been saying to people that every vote for me would strengthen my hand in those negotiations, um, because it will be about sitting down and making sure we get a good deal. But remember, it's not just about us trading into them. It's about them trading into the UK as well. And I think there's a benefit to them about getting arranging a deal that is going to be as frictionless uh, and tariff free as possible, too. Well, achieving frictionless movements, because at the moment there are no borders. So if you want to achieve frictionless movement going forward, you're going to have to put electronic systems in place, chief is being replaced. There's lots of things that are obviously in your plan to do and are all very good, but they will come at a cost to companies like us to implement and to adhere to, to achieve the same sort of frictionless movement that we enjoy at the moment. So that was what my question was about. How is the government going to make sure that not only, obviously, we, we know you're going to negotiate the best deal, but how are you going to make sure that companies like Cross are not disadvantaged in the process of reaching that point? Well, we want to, I mean, first of all, we will work, as we're doing this, we will be working with industry, with businesses across the different sectors to see how we can best do this in a way that is going to cause least disruption and least impact on, on companies. And you're right, we are looking at various solutions in terms of the border, some of which may be electronic solutions to, to deal with that. The variety of issues that we can look at and we'll be negotiating on. But what we want to do is to take, if you like, take business and industry with us as we're doing that. Um, to ensure that we're working uh, with the grain of business and industry and that we truly understand what the impact of any particular move we make on business and industry will be. But it is about making sure that we, with that understanding, we can go into those negotiations with a strong hand to make sure that we are getting that best possible deal that is going to be as little disruptive, as, you know, with least disruption and least impact on businesses who are trading freely across those borders at the moment. Hello. Uh, you mentioned uh, house prices. Uh, we are building houses in Bath, which is a good thing. Um, but they seem to still be too priced too high. They're well beyond the means of most people here. I know many of us travel, I don't, but many people here travel a long way to work every day. Um, how would you think you, this could be addressed in the future? 
Well, there's a number of things. We actually published some ideas before I called the election about what we could do to improve the housing market. Um, part of it is about the supply of housing that's available, actually. Um, and there's a number of things we want to do on that. It's not just encouraging more house building, but it's also trying to make sure that when planning permissions are given, actually, to builders, they then actually get on and build those houses, because often you see that happening and then the houses not being built. We want to see a greater diversity in terms of um, housing construction. So if you look at some other countries, there's more... Um, there's more self-build, there's more of the sort of modular build of, of houses, which can have an impact on the, uh, on the price. So we want to see a greater diversity in that. And then also help people, because the other side of the equation, if you like, is helping people who are trying to buy a house with things like help to buy, with shared ownership schemes, um, which will enable people to get that first foot on the housing ladder, um, perhaps more easily than if they were having to go you know, full hog into, into uh, buying a, a, a house. So it's both helping people on the financial side, helping people to buy with various schemes and trying to free up the housing market in a way that, that doesn't see development um, just being put down willy-nilly, but actually make sure that when we do get planning permissions given, we see those houses being built and that we get a greater diversity of types of houses and homes being built. Is there any, one, one here? Thank you so much, Prime Minister. Sorry, one here and then at the back, yes. Um, I had a question about uh, the joint scientific research projects that are currently taking place with, uh, with the help of EU, like European Space Agency program, uh, CERN, um, uh, Cullum Center Fusion Research. So what's the plan going forward? Are we going to continue with that? Or if we leave them alone, how are we going to fund all our scientific research going forward? Well, the, the, and the answer is there'll be um, a variety of different approaches in the sense we'll have to look at certain agencies and our relationship with certain, certain agencies like the European Space Agency and there's a list of others. And that will be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis to negotiate what our future relationship is. There's also funding that comes, for example, to universities um, through various projects and, and co-research projects. And while we're in the EU, we want to continue to see people um, being able to be part of that, and I think that's important. But again, part of our negotiation will be about how we can maintain those links in the future. And of course, we do have links to, uh, of these sorts with countries that are outside the European Union at the moment. So it's not that everything would be immediately cut off if we lose the, uh, leave the EU, but it's about how we uh, negotiate on particular a particular institutions and agencies our continuing relationship with them. But one of the 12 objectives I've set out for the EU is I want the UK to be one of the best places for science and innovation and that we have a specific objective in our negotiations of ensuring that we can retain that uh, working with the European countries on science, on innovation, on research and technology for the future. There's one at the back. About cuts today. But I've not heard anything about the NHS cuts that are happening. And I'm just concerned that are you going to keep on cutting until it ends up being privatised? Or are you going to be able to get some money and put it back into the NHS, which was promised when Brexit happened? Well, first of all, there is absolutely no suggestion of the privatisation of the health service. We believe in a national health service that continues to be free at the point of use. Uh, what is uh, crucial is you, in terms of funding for the NHS, we're actually putting record levels of funding into the NHS. So by 2020, it's the figure that came from the 2015 election was by 2020 an extra 10 billion. We said that by the end of this coming parliament, there'll be an extra 8 billion. So that uh, represents uh, real terms increases each year for the funding for the National Health Service. We need to make sure that money is being spent effectively in the NHS. Over, over these five years, we're spending half a trillion pounds on the National Health Service. Um, and uh, we need to make sure that that money is being spent effectively. So we're doing some other things. For example, in the budget, we're putting some more money into accident and emergency uh, so that hospitals can, some hospitals need to adapt their accident and emergency to make sure they're giving patients the best possible treatment. Not everybody who turns up a day and he needs to go into the hospital. It's making sure the patient gets the best possible treatment and that can free up hospital resources. But we're helping hospitals as they need to do that. So we announced some extra money for the NHS in the budget. Even with that, with all this extra money going in, why are we still in such a crisis then? Well, the, I've talked about the large amount of money we're spending on the NHS. Actually, every year, we're making more and more demands of the NHS. That's one of the issues that we're, that we're facing. And uh, so if you look at the figures, we now do 
I think it's nearly 12 million operations in the last year, nearly 12 million operations in the NHS. That's nearly 2 million more than were done in 2010. Uh, if you look at how our population is ageing, of course, that also puts uh, a pressure on the NHS. And that's why it's so important to make sure that we are spending the money as effectively as possible in the NHS. But it will be, it will be records amounts of funding going into the NHS in the future under a Conservative government. Was there another question? Any more questions from the workforce? No, then I can go to the media. Faisal. Yes, uh, Prime Minister, if, uh, if you're so strong and Jeremy Corbyn's so weak, as you said, why have you sent Amber Rudd to take on his arguments at the debate tonight? <laughs> Look. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm interested, you know, in, in the fact that Jeremy Corbyn seems to be paying far more attention to how many appearances on telly he's doing. I think he ought to be paying a little more attention to thinking about Brexit negotiations. That's what I'm doing to make sure we get the best possible deal for Britain. Laura. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister, but forgive me, on, on the same issue, public scrutiny is a very important part of any election campaign. He's now up for a head-to-head -head debate. Doesn't it suggest that you're frightened of taking him on directly if you don't go too? No, as you know, Laura, first of all, I've been taking Jeremy Corbyn on directly, uh, week in and week out in Prime Minister's questions. Secondly, actually, yes, public scrutiny is for an election campaign, but that's why taking questions from members of the public who are going to be voting on the 8th of June is so important. That's what I enjoy, enjoy doing during the, uh, during the campaigns. And uh, I think that's really important. That's why I've been doing that up and, uh, up and round the country. Um, but I think the other interesting question is, I feel sorry for ITV. Why didn't he do their debate? Emily. Emily from ITV News. Uh, <laughs> Prime Minister, you say that you are meeting voters up and down the country, but tonight you have a chance to reach millions of voters if you debated on television. Millions of voters who will now feel snubbed by the fact that you're not going to turn up. No, look, I, I've been very clear from the start that the sort of campaign I want to do is about taking questions, meeting people and taking questions. I've not been off the television screens. I've been doing things with, uh, in the television, but predominantly taking questions from the voters and listening to voters. I think debates where the politicians are squabbling among themselves doesn't do anything uh, for, uh, for the uh, process of electioneering. I think actually it's about getting out and about, meeting voters and hearing directly from voters. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jack Maiman from the Daily Telegraph. Uh, Prime Minister, I'm sure you've seen the front page of the Times today, which suggests that your party could be on course uh, to lose, actually lose seats on June 8th rather than gain seats. Can I ask, will you resign if you lose seats on June the 8th? Look, Jack, the, there's only one poll that matters, and that's the poll that takes place on June the 8th. Uh, and when it comes to that poll, people have a very clear choice. And that choice is about who's going to be Prime Minister. It's about who's going to lead the UK in those Brexit negotiations, who has the plan to do that, the determination to get the best deal, who has the strong and stable leadership to do that. But it's also about who will take this country forward for the future. I believe there is a great future for this country. We can be even more prosperous uh, when we ensure we get the Brexit deal right. But there are opportunities out there which we should be grasping as a country. And I believe, as I said earlier in my remarks, I believe we can do that, we can see that better future, because I believe in Britain and I believe in the British people. Uh, ben. Thank you, Prime Minister Ben Glaze, Daily Mirror. Um, isn't the truth of why you're not going to the debate tonight that you're worried that people will see you under pressure, under scrutiny, and they won't like what they see, and they will think that's what it'll be like in Brexit negotiations, and they won't vote for you? <laughs> no. I've set, out, I've set out very clearly what I think an election campaign should be about. It's about getting out and around the country. It's about meeting voters. It's about hearing questions directly from voters. I think that's important. And it's about being open with voters, which I've been in my manifesto about the challenges that lie ahead for this country, but also about the opportunities that lie ahead for this country and how together we can actually build that better future. I think this is the last one. Lucy Fisher from The Times. 
Um, Prime Minister, this morning you're in Plymouth in a seat the Conservatives are defending. Today, this afternoon, you're in Bath in another seat that you're defending. Have you given up altogether on trying to make seat gains? No, I've been around the country in all variety of seats. Yesterday, I was in seats that we don't hold. Uh, I've done that, and I've done both uh, during the campaign, as, of course, any leader does. But what is crucial is that wherever I am, the message I want to, to give to voters is very simple, and it is about this crucial choice. We stand at a really important moment for our country. We have an opportunity to build an even greater Britain for the future. We need to get Brexit right, and those negotiations start 11 days after Election Day. The question people need to ask themselves, it's not a question about who they voted for in the past, it's about who they want to take this country forward, to provide that leadership for this country, to get Brexit right, and build a better future for us all. That's what I offer, and that's what I believe is important for the future of this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, that's Theresa May speaking in Bath. She was at a factory talking to workers and the media, talking of taking things a little bit in, t in terms of the domestic issues and the domestic policies that the Tories have to offer with education, saying that she will change the current situation where some schools get more money than others. But again, she turned it to Brexit, saying that she believes the UK can make a success of Brexit and she will make a success for ordinary families. And as, I said, and as you heard there, speaking to the media afterwards, including our very own um, Faisal Islam. But let's go to Robert Nesbitt, who's also in Bath and um, heard um, Theresa May speaking just a moment ago. And Robert, when it came to the questions, the main question is why is she not attending this TV debate tonight? And um, it was still a, a clear no from her, really, wasn't it? Repeatedly, no. Uh, she was under quite a lot of pressure there, I would say, from, uh, from all of the broadcasters and some of the newspaper journalists as well, asking why she wasn't going to be going to this uh, debate tonight, now that Jeremy Corbyn has decided to do it. Her response was that she faces Jeremy Corbyn every week across the dispatch box at Prime Minister's Question Time. Uh, and she repeated the fact that she was travelling up and down the country and talking to real voters, and also saying that opening herself up to questions uh, from uh, f uh, factory workers and office workers, as she has done just now, that is the kind of scrutiny that she thinks uh, voters really care about, rather than exchanging sound bites uh, with six other leaders uh, at the event tonight in Cambridge. But really, I think it was a win-win for, for Labour by suddenly deciding to go to it tonight. Because remember, Jeremy Corbyn wasn't going to be going to uh, Cambridge this evening, uh, because now uh, she's being called a coward, in effect, certainly by some of the the noisy protesters uh, behind me and some of the uh, official uh, uh, Labour operations, uh, whereas, you know, if she had decided to go, then she would have been dancing to his tune. Uh, so in both ways, she was put under pressure. Uh, and I think that's why she allowed a lot of those quite tough questions, I think, from some of the people who work uh, at this uh, aerospace uh, factory uh, to carry on, indeed, allowing some of them to follow up uh, their questions. So one man who asked her about the NHS and she said uh, that there was no uh, danger of it being privatised, that there were record levels of funding going into it and again this increasing emphasis on how the money is spent uh, within the NHS. Uh, after he'd asked that question, clearly wasn't satisfied with her answer, she allowed him to come back and I think that's uh, what she has to do uh, to deflect uh, accusations of running scared by uh, engaging in these kind of exchanges with uh, voters. It should be he said so. Uh, said though, this doesn't happen every day that she allows herself to be uh, questioned by general members of the public. And remember, there are certain restrictions under which members of the press can ask her questions. We can't grab the microphone, for example, and ask follow-up after follow-up. It is contained in that way. Uh, but she has made it very clear today that she doesn't intend uh, to go to the event this evening. So it will be Jeremy Corbyn with the other leaders, but with Amber Rudd instead of Theresa May. OK, Robin Ismet in Bath. Thanks very much. Right, let's change tack to the United States now, where there have been reports for about the last 90 minutes or thereabouts of President Trump 
is poised to pull the country out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. At the G7 summit on Saturday, he refused to endorse the landmark climate change accord, saying he needed more time to decide. Under the pact, the United States commit is committed to reducing its emissions by 28% uh, from its 2000 levels by 2025. Uh, let's turn to our US correspondent, Amanda Walker, who's in Washington. Amanda, welcome to you. If this comes to pass, this would be the biggest single act that this president so far has uh, committed to? It would. There's no question about it. Certainly the impact that it has, not just on America, but on the rest of the world. So we woke up to a flurry of rumours here this morning, uh, which seems to have built to a consensus that Donald Trump is expected to pull out of the Paris climate deal. Um, what we've heard from Donald Trump so far is via Twitter, as usual. He said that he will make his decision or announce his decision in the next few days followed by Make America Great Again. Now, obviously, as we often do, we read into Donald Trump's tweets. Make America Great Again was, of course, uh, his slogan during the campaign that appealed to his base. And really, politically, this is being seen as uh, an issue about whether he wants to appeal to his base and his advisers like Steve Bannon or whether he wants to appeal to those leaders that he met at the G7, whether he wants to appeal to the big bosses, the chief executives of companies like Apple, ExxonMobil even, Walmart, who have said to Donald Trump that we should stay in the Paris climate deal. Also, his daughter, Ivanka Trump, has been trying to encourage him to stay in the deal. So whatever way he eventually goes, uh, the rumours and certainly the reports coming out of the White House, not officially yet this morning, are that he's leaning towards pulling out, will give a very clear indication as to where he is putting his own loyalty, where he is putting his weight. And that would suggest that at the moment that is going with his advisers, uh, who are very much more isolationist, this America first policy, which is something that Steve Bannon has really pushed, and that his base uh, felt pretty strongly about during the campaign. So he's teasing this out. We've seen this before, for example, with his uh, Secretary of State pick, uh, also his uh, pick for the Supreme Court. He likes the theatre of this. This is a former reality. TV star, of course, and of everybody on the climate change side of things saying that this is nothing to play with, this is nothing to build suspense about, this is a hugely